Healthcare Onomics Changing Healthcare by Changing the Way You Think About Healthcare. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthcare Onomics. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Way Casey, and this is episode one of Healthcare Onomics for Physicians, a specialized segment where I'm going to have a series of videos where I discuss policies, procedures, things that are impacting physicians here in Texas, where I live, as well as across the nation. And today with me, my special guest is uh, the first Texan that I've ever interviewed in my podcast series, so I'm kind of proud of that, a fellow Texan. Uh, I, I am from Texas. I don't sound like like it, but uh, David Balot is a Houstonian, if I'm getting that correct, who used to be a hospital administrator until he saw the light and decided to go over to the good side of healthcare and help change policy, where he now works with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. David also ran for Congress last year, and this is how he and I met when he reached out to me and asked me for an endorsement. And I remember saying, kind of cautiously, I'll endorse you if you'll agree to one thing. You agree not to accept any money from health insurance lobbyists. David not only said, okay, he put that on his website, and he said, I'm not accepting any money from not only the health insurance lobby, but also from Big Pharma. And to my, uh, to his credit, he didn't accept any money. Of course, he didn't win, which is unfortunate. And I'm not sure if that's really changed David's mind about running again or not, but I will tell you that he stands for what's right for health care and for health uh, and insurance reform, and he's who we would need, the kind, the kind of guy that we definitely need in Congress helping us out. But in light of that, he's doing some good work with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So with that introduction, David, why don't you tell us your, about your position with that institution and what you do? Uh, I appreciate the kind words. And, and if I ever do run again, I'm going to use a part of this episode to uh, have that endorsement on my website. <laughs> you so bet. thank you again. <laughs> I you appreciate bet. that. Anytime. You know, I'm, 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 you know, in, in a way, I got into... Uh, uh, politics because I was in healthcare and I saw that people in DC didn't really understand healthcare. Uh, too often we hear about, and I, you see this on, I see this on your social media all the time. When people, when politicians especially talk about healthcare, they're not talking about healthcare. They're talking no. about health insurance. Right. And exactly. coverage is not care. And we we both are very passionate about that. And I continue in that passion. And that's why I went to uh, go on and, and run for for office. I say that I'm thankful I didn't win because yeah. I feel that right now I have a much larger platform to make it a, a, an impact for change. Right. And um, I, I continued on and, and had a uh, I continued to campaign for health care reform after I lost uh, on my own dime and uh, came across these good folks here at Texas Public Policy Foundation. And they've asked me to come be their director for um, the Right on Healthcare Initiative, with, which is both federal and state, and we're working with a number of other states as well. So, a uh, much bigger platform than uh, I would have had as a congressman. And again, I'm I'm as pleased as I can be to be a part of such a, a wonderful organization, uh, and being able to make an impact and educate our legislators at various levels. Now, one of the TPPF alums, if I'm not mistaken, did make it into Congress from Texas this year, the inestimable Chip Roy, uh, a good friend uh, on Twitter and a, and a good, great guy, stand-up guy for health care and health insurance reform as well. So tell us a little bit about what TPPF, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, does exactly. We advance the principles of liberty. And we, whether it be in, in tax reform, education, um, criminal justice. The first step back that was uh, signed into law by the president in December of last year was actually something that had been in the works for over 12 years, wow. uh, but started here at TPPF. Oh, wow. So I I'm, didn't I'm, know that. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, these, these, uh, these folks here, um, they, they care deeply about uh, freedom, uh, about the thing, the, fo the thing that the founding fathers um, – really espoused yeah. for what our country would and should be. Individual so, liberty, you mean. Individual yeah. liberty, yeah. personal Absolutely. responsibility, Absolutely. limited Absolutely. government. Absolutely. Those are the things that we look for. And, and Great. That's, uh, because my my viewpoints were, were um, in line with, with those values, they've asked me to come on board and really uh, uh, grow this health care component. Yeah, so they, they, they and I hooked up last year. We connected on Twitter, uh, on social media, the TPPF. And at first I was like, what are these guys doing? I started looking into it and I was like, this is right up my alley. This is perfect because 
you know, individual responsibility. I can think of few other fields than, uh, oh, I don't know, your health. Then that are more important, that are more, you know, just self-evident that you need to have personal responsibility for your health. If you turn it over to the government, if you turn it over to politicians, if you turn it over to third party payers and insurers and everyone else to overlook that, uh, you're going to not be so healthy. You got a very good chance of not being so healthy. So I absolutely agree with what the TPPF is doing. 100% support their cause and I'm behind them every step of the way. So let's make some changes. So in light of that, recently, and this is why I asked you to be on the show, the TPPF just recently did something here in the state of Texas that I thought was um, very interesting and needs to happen because Texas is one of only three, correct me if I'm wrong, one of only three states in the union. Am I correct? Five states. Five states. Only one of five states in the entire United States where medication dispensing is forbidden by physicians in their offices. In other words, I run a direct patient care practice here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and if I want to prescribe someone, say, a course of amoxicillin, which is an antibiotic very commonly used for strep throat, it's a lifesaver. It's a game changer. It really has helped a lot of people out. And it's so common, it grows on trees practically. In fact, it's so common that the cost of this drug, remember, it's not the cost of healthcare that are outrageous, it's the charges, but the cost of this drug is pennies per tablet or per capsule. In fact, you can get it for $4 for a full course, a a two-week course of this stuff. You can get it for 4 bucks at discount pharmacies like Walmart. Sorry if I mentioned Walmart. But in any case... um, If you go to these big box pharmacy stores, or especially if you use your health insurance, you could wind up paying a $10 copay and then filing a health insurance claim and all kinds of nonsense for a drug that is literally pennies, folks, to produce. So by prescribing this and administering it in a physician's office uh, for common things like strep throat, etc., physicians in 45 other states outside of Texas and four others are able to just go ahead and and prescribe the medication for the patient and dispense it to the patient right there, sell it to the patient, and and save that patient a trip to the pharmacy. And from the DPC, the direct patient care physicians I've seen uh, touting what they do across the internet, they're selling this for less than, than four bucks. For, for a prescription, they're selling it for a dollar or two. Now, I'm only using amoxicillin as an example here because it's very common and it's one that most people are, are aware of. But we have things like high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, uh, thyroid problems. These medications are all dirt cheap and could and should and would be, in fact, are being dispensed and sold by physicians in 45 other states. So, again, sorry for the long-winded, intro- long-winded introduction there, David, but tell us what the TPPF has taken on now in, in an effort to change all that. No, it's an important issue, and I'm glad you covered it the way you did. Uh, let me just say that in the state of Texas, it can be done, but under very limited criteria. Rural doctors, where there is not a pharmacy within 15 miles, oh, and I okay. believe in counties of less than 5,000. So, okay. it's it's very restrictive and and it's done, but you also have to report to the, the Board of Pharmacy. Oh, I see. There are two bills currently in the legislature that we're looking at that we're both that we're supporting both of um, them as they're working their way through. Uh, we want patients to have choice. Yeah. I mean, the problem is choice, as they say in in that uh, that movie, The Matrix. <laughs> we want we want them to be able to have choice. We want them to be able to have that freedom. Right. This isn't something new. This isn't something that's unique. It's been tried and it's been tested and it's been found. Uh, to be safe. And a lot of the opposition to this bill has been that, well, it's, there's not, um, it's not a safe practice. The patients yeah. are going to be in danger. And yeah. we've found research and we've published research, and you can find that on our website at texaspolicy.com. Okay. Uh, if you go to uh, the issues, you can uh, search by healthcare alone. And, and there is uh, some good research there that was produced by our policy analyst, Jennifer Minjares. And it shows that the adverse drug reactions uh, were identical between physicians and pharmacists. So there is no safety issue, per se. You mean, when you say adverse drug reactions, let's let's dig into that a little bit. You're talking sure. about, like, the prospect of prescribing too many drugs for a patient or perhaps prescribing a drug for someone that has an allergy that they're not aware of or what have you. So when we talk about adverse reactions, we're talking about whether or not the physician prescribes and admit the physician always prescribes the drug, okay? Pharmacists don't prescribe right. drugs. They're the only ones that can. Yeah, so I'm yeah. the only guy that can, or I'm the only physician, I'm the only person in this equation who can prescribe the drug. Now, the question becomes, who administers it? Who gives it to the patient? Who sells it to the patient? That's right. And what we're saying is physicians in 45 other states are able to do that. And by doing so, they're able to 
certainly save the patients a trip to the pharmacy, potentially save them a lot of money by discounting that medication through their practice. Because again, it costs them pennies to buy this stuff by the truckload. Um, so what you're saying, though, is the research has borne out that whether I administer it or whether uh, a pharmacist administers it, it's pretty much the same uh, uh, bad reaction uh, to the medication rate. There, there's no difference in who's, who's administering this drug, correct? Right. And the only difference is that the perception was that if there was an advance or a, a, a drug reaction of some sort and it, it was dispensed by the physician, the propensity for the patient to call the physician and get some guidance guess, was let me higher. Guess. Let me guess. Yeah, it was probably greater. It was yeah. probably greater because they have a they have a direct relationship with the physician. So if, right. the, if something goes wrong, the patient's much more likely to pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, this is messing me up. Yeah, okay. Wow, wow. I did not know that piece of the research. I was going to guess that, but you beat me to it. <laughs> so again, who's opposing this? And uh, and tell us why they're opposing it. You probably already did tell us why, but but uh, yeah, tell, tell us who's opposing this. Well, it's... It's it's a, a wide array of people, but in uh, and and you can see from uh, we had a, a panel discussion here recently, and the folks that are opposing it are the independent pharmacists, and, and for them they're, you know, they're under a lot of attack as well, and they're, yeah, sure. they're uh, you know they're having a hard time with the pharmacy benefit managers and the insurance companies. I mean, let's talk about why it's it's less expensive in the doctor's office, and and yeah. circle back around to your original question. Doctors are buying wholesale and probably not as cheaply as as the independent pharmacists or the pharmacies, uh, but we can sell or the physicians can sell at a cheaper rate because yeah. they're not having to deal with insurance contracts and pharmacy right. benefit manager contracts exactly. that uh, really uh, cause those those prices to skyrocket. Uh, it really is is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, the uh, the physicians can can sell for a 10% markup and when they're buying them at pennies a, a pill it's not much of a a price yeah. for the patient at all. Yeah, you pass the savings on to the patient. Um, let, let's dive into that a little bit more. You mentioned that physicians can't even buy these medications as cheaply as, say, the pharmacies do. And that's because if I'm buying a bottle of 100 tablets, the pharmacy may be buying a bottle of 10,000 tablets uh, that's going to last them a month, whereas my bottle may last me, you know, especially since I don't dispense, my bottle lasts me indefinitely, which I don't buy these medications because I don't dispense them. But I do happen to know that a whole bottle of 100 amoxicillin capsules costs a couple of bucks if you just buy them yeah. through medication wholesalers. And that's my price. That's not if I bought them at 10000 a piece or 100000 a piece. So physicians buying in bulk creates a bigger discount for the physicians, which means bigger savings for the patients, you would think. Not to mention, again, there's that hassle factor. I, I remember, and I, I, I told you I was going to tell you this story, but I do remember this story one time where I got a, a prescription for a uh, dental paste, you know, uh, the fluoride paste or whatever okay. for my dentist. So I went into my friendly uh, grocery store pharmacy. This is 20 years ago. And I remember uh, walking up there and handing the prescription over to the pharmacist. And he turned around and he walked back to this shelf and he came back and he looks at me and he goes, would you like the mint or would you like the cherry? And I was like, uh, I think I'll take the mint, please. And he goes, okay, that'll be half an hour. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> what are you doing? Give me the medication. And so the hassle factor was there. I think he was trying to run it through my insurance or anything like that, but I just basically ended up paying cash, as I've always done for my prescriptions. But, uh, you know, it took him half an hour. It took him 45 minutes to get this medication. I think actually the deal was they wanted me to rummage through the store and go do some shopping, so there's probably some psychology involved there. But nevertheless... No, I, I really do think it had <laughs> everything to do with the insurance preauthorizations and yeah. the benefits and, you know, those things that all doctors know that they have to go through in order to right. see a patient. Right. That's why... That's why overhead is, is, is what it is, is because you have to do uh, go through this gauntlet uh, to get payment for the services that you're rendering. Yeah. You're spending more money on administrative folks than you are on clinical. But, you know, and let's talk about insurance. I just wanted to bring this up as well. People are always wanting to have a copay for their, for their pharmacy uh, products. And I explained to them, if it's a generic product, you have paid two to three times by, yeah. by paying your copay 
if you would have just paid cash. You always yeah. ask what the cash amount is when you buy pharma- pharmaceutical uh, products. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I write about it in, in my first book, The Guide to Buying Health Insurance and Healthcare. I write about this, how I save patients money by telling them, hey, look, although I can't dispense this medicine for you, you can go get it at certain pharmacies for four bucks. And they're like, wow, but I have or less. a... Or less. Or I have a $10 copay on my health insurance. And I'm like, well, gosh, let's see. That's... You know, anyway, that's 10 bucks and you have to file a claim. Your health insurance rates are going to go up and then, you know, you're only getting anyway. It's 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 all such a mess. So no, tell I us. Had, I had a similar example. I, I was prescribed uh, medication after I was in a car wreck yeah. and didn't have insurance at the time. I sent my son to the pharmacy. I said, just let me know if, you know, if it's an excessively high amount. And he came back, didn't call me, handed me the receipt. It was two dollars and 52 cents. Wow. <laughs> My copay would have been $25. Yeah, that's right. Ten times that amount. Ten times. Ten times. So tell us where this bill is in Congress and how the TPPF is, is helping push it along to counter the efforts of the opposers, if you will. Well, not in Congress. It's in the, in, in the, in the state legislature. Excuse so me. It's in, there are two House bills. Um, they're uh, 460 and 1622. Okay. And – one has been heard in committee, and there have been physicians that have come through and, and testified and shared their, their support. Uh, the other one is yet to be scheduled for a committee hearing, so we're waiting. And, and if you're in Texas and you want to come to uh, uh, to give testimony in support of this bill, we encourage you to do it. Yes. They will listen to you. They will listen to as many testimonies as there are people signed up okay. in the state of Texas. There's no time limit. We've had some hearings go to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So, uh, if uh, you're so inclined and you care about this and you want to see this uh, be something that is enacted in the state of Texas as it has been in 45 other states, please show your support. And is that and c- they can certainly call their state legislators as well, write their state legislators. I highly that encourage that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, to email and write and just keep up the campaign. Well, your legislator, and then also I, I don't think it would hurt to call uh, those representatives that sit on the Public Health Committee. Okay. Okay. And where can uh, physicians and other people find this information? Can they go to Texas Foundation? Tech, what's the website again? Uh, TexasPolicy.com is the Texas TPPF Policy. website, but okay. the best place to go is Texas Legislature Online. Okay. If oh. you just type those words into Google, it'll be the first uh, option that pops up, and you can find just uh, – a treasure chest of information. So I, yeah, I'll, I'll have all these links below uh, so that people can go there easily and find this information. You. Um, so you, the TPPF, y'all had a meeting recently, correct? You had a, a conference roundtable. When was that? That was last week, I believe. It was last Thursday. Last Thursday. Okay. And tell us what happened there. Who attended oh, and, and what was discussed? Well, it was regarding this this research that we've put together. It was regarding the bills that uh, we're advocating for or that uh, we're, we're supportive of, rather. Um, and we had some experts come in, and we had uh, the president-elect for the Alliance of Independent Pharmacists, uh, Carter High. We had Dr. Chris Held, who is a direct care specialist in San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, we had Josh Umber, who is a direct yeah. care um, doctor out of Kansas. And we also had Representative Matt Shaheen, and he's the author of, of Bill 460. I see. Eight, House Bill 460. And we, Dr. Dean Waldman was also, he's our, our distinguished senior fellow here with TPPF, and he right. moderated the roundtable, essentially. And that can be found on our website as well. So it, it's if somebody wants to sit through the hour and seven minutes, they're more than welcome to do that. Uh, it was actually a very good panel discussion and, and uh there was a lot to be gained from it. Good. It's interesting to hear both sides of the story, and, and you'll end up with your c- conclusions based on a, a lot of good information. And just for clarification, Dr. Waldman is a physician, correct? He's he not is. A, He's a pediatric yeah. cardiologist. Yeah, yeah, I know Dean. He, he, he's a great guy. So yes. I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about something else now that we've cleared up the uh, issue. And please, if you're a physician or a patient in Texas, go to your legislator and, and, and badger them, bug them, write them, email them, call them. Let them know that you support Hopefully you support physician dispensing medication in Texas. But let's switch really quickly to another topic that you and I have discussed in the past. And I want to clear this up for folks, especially physicians and patients out there, to uh, discuss the whole idea of health insurance fraud. What exactly constitutes health insurance fraud? Because I have written in my book, the, the, the book that I wrote, The Guide to Buying Health Insurance and Healthcare, that if you are a patient 
and you have health insurance, it's my understanding, now correct me if I am wrong here, David, but it's my understanding, I can't find any law that supersedes this, you have the right as a patient to decide whether or not to use your health insurance to pay for your health care. Am I correct in assuming that? Absolutely. So as a patient, you can say, I don't want to use my health insurance. Now, the better way to approach that, the better way to do that, in my, in my view, is to just tell the health care provider, wherever you are, I don't have health insurance. Because if you say, I don't want to use your health insurance, you may give the cat, you, you, the cat may be out of the bag at that point. You may give yourself up, and if they look through and find your health insurance benefits, you know, look at it this way. If you're a health care provider, would you rather charge somebody $1,200 for something or $25 for something? I mean, it's pretty pretty obvious what the health care provider is going to do. And in fact, they may be, they may be ba- uh, forced to do that. They may be uh, obliged to do that by basis of their health insurance contract. So let me clarify what I'm getting at here. Here's the question I have for you, Mr. Balot, policy expert ex-hospital administrator, is it possible for a patient to commit health insurance fraud by simply telling a health care provider, I don't have health insurance? Well, I would never support telling a lie. I think if you want to be a cash patient, you'll say, I'm a cash patient. Okay, okay. So, and, and yeah. There, there's no fraud associated with not using a service that, that you've purchased. If you yeah. don't want to use your insurance card, that's fine. There's no sure. law that says that you're beholden and obligated to use that insurance. You okay. can certainly be a cash patient. Gotcha. Well, I'm I'm a little different stripe. I do support telling lies when it comes to saving this kind of money. I understand well, your we're position. We're going to end the interview right now. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I support your position. I understand where you're coming from. I think you understand where I'm coming from. Patients, tell them whatever you got to do in order to save yourself a lot of money. And you will if you don't use your health insurance for the majority of your health care purchases. The problem is, and I have a story about this, I, I had a young man who came into my, my uh, clinic one time with a metal foreign body in his finger, and digging these things out is quite a bit uh, more challenging than it might seem at first glance. So I, I, I told him, I said, look, I, you know, I'm going to try this. If it doesn't work, I'm going to have to send you somewhere where they can do this under x-ray guidance. And he said, sure. So I numbed his finger up. I tried to get it out. I, I was unsuccessful. Again, there's a lot more to the finger than you'd think there is, folks. So um, I said, look, I'm going to send you over here to the surgeon. They have an x-ray in their, in their office they can do this with. It, you know. But here's the thing. You have a $5,000 deductible HMO health insurance plan. So don't tell them you have health insurance or else you're going to be hosed. You won't be able to get this out today. And they'll charge you an arm and a leg versus if you just go over there and say, hey, look, I'm paying cash for this. How much is it? They might charge you a few hundred bucks to dig this out of your finger and you'll be done today. So what does he do? He goes over to the surgeon's practice and he, and he pulls a fast one. He's a really smart guy. He says, look, how much is it if I say, you know, I don't have health insurance? And they say, oh, well, it'll be this much. Okay, now how much would it be if I put it on my health insurance plan? And they dug through his health insurance plan instead of digging through his finger. And they found that he had this HMO. And sure enough, what did they tell him? Oh, you, we can't even see you today. You have to go through your PCP, which I'm not his PCP. And you have to do all this. Well, the guy left me a nasty Google review, which I thought was unjust. But in any other universe, this guy would have listened to me and said, listen, I'm just going to go over there and pay him cash. And that's it. But he still believed in the power of health insurance. And as such, I don't know what ended up happening to him. He probably had to go to an emergency room, which sent his bill even more through the stratosphere and filed a huge insurance claim. And he's probably on the hook for $5,000 since he had a deductible he hadn't met. So the bottom line is, had this gentleman just simply taken my advice and gone over there and said one of two things, either lied outright and said, I don't have health insurance, or just chosen not to use his health insurance and said, look, I'm I'm just going to pay cash pay. How much is it? He would have saved himself a boatload of money, and he would not have committed health insurance fraud. I want to get that through patients' heads. You're not there's, committing there's health no, insurance no, fraud. There's no fraud whatsoever. It, again, right. you, you have the choice to use it. It's You're not compelled to use that little card in your wallet uh, for services. You can say, I'm a cash patient. And I I, I supported that when I was was running a hospital. There was no reason why, you know, we can talk about charges and prices later, but the average <laughs> the average CAT scan charge in 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 Houston is about six seven thousand uh, dollars. 
and we would get paid anywhere from fifteen hundred to twenty two hundred dollars per per scan, depending on on the contract and the location. Now that's through insurance. That's through insurance. So you bill six seven thousand bucks, you get paid fifteen hundred to twenty two hundred twenty five hundred. Yeah. Okay. I, I had I had a cash uh, cash rate for those that were going to pay that day, and. I could charge two hundred and fifty dollars and still make a profit. Yeah, just just to show you how how much of a problem it is with our current system. It, there's a lot of fr- uh, fat. There's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of abuse. There's a lot of waste. Right. And the healthcare does not have to be as expensive as it is today. No, it does not. Government government is 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 a big problem. And if you if you track the regulations that we've uh, been implementing as a country since 1960 and 1965. Uh, across the, the spectrum of time, you'll see the cost continue to increase. And I actually just posted something, uh, a little snapshot that, that is a, a good indicator of that on my, my Twitter. Wow. Well, so tell us where the TPBF is headed, especially with your expertise now that you've joined. Tell us where you guys are, he- where y'all, excuse me, where y'all are headed for That's the future. That's appropriate. <laughs> Absolutely. I would expect nothing less here uh, between two Texans. So tell us where the TPPF is headed and what direction y'all are going in and, and what y'all hope to achieve, especially with the upcoming 2020 election. Well, we're, we're about solutions. We're looking to, uh, through research, through good policy, we're looking to work with the leadership to find solutions. Too often, um, folks on, on uh, the conservative side of the aisle have been more contrarian. It's it's about repealing and replacing and being against this and against that. And not to say that we shouldn't be. Um, a lot of those ideas are, are poor, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But we really haven't had much in the way of solutions. Yeah. And so we need we need to design and plan for what is the best way for uh, for the people of this country and the people of the great state of Texas to get uh, affordable and accessible health care. Of course, you're going to understand when I say that a lot of it has to do with deregulating the encroachment of government in between the relationship of physician and, and patient. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I, I point out that, uh, and I, I firmly believe this, that the key to all this is the patient. The key yeah. to solving the healthcare, what I call the great American healthcare fiasco, is the patient. Uh, if patients don't do it, no one is, because no one else is as incentivized. Not even me, folks, not even physicians are as incentivized as you are, as patients, to change this system up. So everybody needs to get involved. I like to say that if you have a $5,000 deductible on your health insurance plan, cons- con- congratulations. You're now a health care consumer. Now act like it. So, uh, again, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today, David. It's been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm looking forward to many other appearances, hopefully, in the, in the future. Uh, we can discuss it. many, many things and keep tabs on what the TPPF is doing. Why don't you once again give us some links to some information, again, regarding TPPF, as well as where folks can go to find the latest legislative advances within Texas regarding the dispensing bill. The website for the Texas Public Policy Foundation is texaspolicy.com, and just a, a great deal of research there uh, yes. from from way back in the beginning. So, and you can you can um, isolate that by just healthcare if you so choose. But we have many many different departments here at, at the foundation. You go to Texas Legislature online. You can just type that into the Google. I don't recall the exact web address, but Texas Legislature online, and you'll be able to find a great deal of information there as it relates to the legislature. And then if uh, I, I post quite a bit of information on uh, on Twitter, as I know that you do as well, Dr. Way Casey, yes. and uh, that's David Balot HC for healthcare. Okay, great. Again, David, thank you so much. Good luck down there in Austin. Enjoy the weather and uh, good luck to the TPPF. We will see you soon. Everybody else, until next time, stay healthy. Now you can easily compare health insurance plans and pick the one that makes the most financial sense with the Dr. W's Equation app, available for Android and iPhone. And for more information on how you can save on health insurance and health care, check out my books. Available now on Amazon, iTunes, and Nook. To help spread this message, please click the like button on this video. You can also subscribe to the Healthcareonomics YouTube channel and visit healthcareonomics.com.